Thank you for inviting me to be here today. Thank you to the organizers. And I'd like to thank a couple of other people on whose broad shoulders we stand. Um, first, Sid Stahl may have failed in retirement, but we have him to thank for the 2002 panel um, on elder abuse, and we have him to thank for the 2010 meeting on elder abuse. Um, also, <laughs> and so much else. Um, also, this event is a direct heir to an event that happened here in 2007. It was a workshop that looked at violence prevention across the spectrum as a um, global matter. And Fran Henry, who's sitting here, was the woman who catalyzed that event. Um, and Patrick, I understand that it was your hard work that translated that event into what we are doing here today into the other workshops and that you assured that um, that, that happened. Um, so thank you to you both. Um, Fran, that day in 2007, elder abuse was an afterthought. Um, and alas, that Day we focused on prevention data, and we don't really have prevention data to discuss today, although elder abuse is not an afterthought today. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from you, Fran. Um, like the uh, families of Sandy Hook Promise, you, <laughs> um, you translated suffering and tragedy into something that is redounding to the public benefit and to the benefit of all of us. So thank you. Sorry, I haven't had enough sleep. Um, I would like to, you know, Bob had the glass half empty, I mean half full, I'm going to give you the glass half empty and then I'm going to get to the full part at the end. Um, my father, my wonderful 91 year old father, um, says that life is a sexually transmitted 100% fatal disease. <laughs> Which is another way of saying we're all in this together. Um, I'm going to talk about seven different aspects of policy and um, awareness, some of which were parts of the Elder Justice Act, some of which, alas, are no longer in there, but hope springs eternal. Um, number one, and number one, we need to expand knowledge because we can't meaningfully formulate policy without knowing what we're doing. Um, we've talked about some of those, some examples here today. First, intervention. Um, we don't know what works. We don't know whether Adult Protective Services works and which model works better than other models. We don't know about mandatory reporting laws. Even um, multidisciplinary teams, which are you know, an article of faith, but there are so many different models. We need to start looking at them. We need to proceed in a more informed way. Um, prevention. We talk a lot about awareness campaigns, and I completely agree. I think that is probably the most important thing we could do. But we don't want to just go out and do an um, awareness campaign. We need to figure out what's a message that actually has a meaningful impact on prevention. Then who do we target with that message? Is it caregivers? Is it older people? Is it decision makers? And then what's the message with which we What's the message that will resonate for those folks? So we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Um, we don't really have a vernacular with which to discuss this issue. I mean, Kathy and I have talked about this. Everybody, and we all know this, everybody has a story. We all have a sense of elder abuse, but we don't really know how to talk about it. So we need to begin discussing that vernacular and figuring out how to, how to um, get there. We don't have a definition of success. So right now, we want to say, what are the outcomes of adult protective services? Well, how do the people we're trying to serve define a successful outcome? It's not by measuring the number of prosecutions. It's not by no measuring the number of investigations or cases opened. How do we define improved well-being? So we really need to grapple with that issue as well. And as Bob and many others have mentioned, data collection. We don't need to completely reinvent the wheel here. Other fields, child abuse has been collecting data since the 70s. And a quite amazing woman named Ying Ying Yuan, who's been involved in that effort since the 70s, said that she worked with key folks in states to develop um, or to identify what are some common data points and then develop some consensus among a smaller group of states that you then roll out to try and start doing that. That's something that we can start in terms of data collection, and it's, I think, an imperative priority. 
Um, and finally, the cost. Bob talked about this, too. We have a few little snippets here and there, but I think we know enough now with, um, with Jinshi's data and Mark's data to know that elder abuse victims have tremendously increased admissions to rates of admissions to hospital, to nursing homes, to emergency departments. That has a very direct impact on Medicare and Medicaid usage. We know that victims of financial exploitation are much more likely to be dually eligible. Those are a very expensive group of folks. So for, as an advocacy matter, we need to begin putting some numbers on this problem, and we need to start um, having those conversations. Um, there's one other cost of elder abuse that doesn't get talked about a lot. If somebody doesn't end up in a hospital or a nursing home, it very likely is going to, it's this tipping over phenomenon that Mark Lax talks about. It tips over otherwise autonomous lives. And if you get your life tipped over, you're more likely to be dependent. And if you're not in an institutional setting or in some other formal care setting, you're more likely to be taken care of by family or other informal caregivers. And as Scott Beach and others have said, that has a tremendous cost, a tremendous social cost also, a health cost and a psychic cost, both on society as well as on individual and familial resources. The second point is that we need to apply what we know. We know a lot. Atul Gawande said in his Cheesecake Factory article in The New Yorker a few months ago that in medicine, good ideas take, still take an appallingly long time to trickle down. Um, that's true in our field, too. We know some stuff about elder abuse, and we have pathways. We, Ron and others have talked about social support or social connection. We have the aging network. We have caregiver support programs. We have faith organizations. We are not taking what we know about elder abuse and integrating it into those pro programs very well. That's low-hanging fruit, and we should be doing that now. Um, we had Jason Carlowish talking yesterday about capacity and competence. We know more than we're applying in capacity evaluations. Um, we still have a lot of APS programs using outdated tools and outdated methods of identifying and, um, and, and addressing capacity and competence. We can do better than we're doing now with existing knowledge and tools. Um, Jackie and I were talking about family justice centers. As Laura Mosqueda says, we forget that old people are part of the family. Family justice centers very rarely incorporate elder abuse. We can do better than that there, too. And, you know, that, that is not everything has to go through this unbelievably broken Congress. I mean, some things can be done by executive order or by agency initiative. For example, requiring that federally funded programs do a better job with elder abuse. Kathy mentioned yesterday home and community home and community based services. We are undergoing a sea change about how we deliver health care. And a lot of it is there are going to be a lot more people who are going to be assessed and who are going to be have the opportunity, I guess, if we call it that, of care management. That is a critical opportunity in terms of doing some better assessment and thinking about um, elder abuse, both in terms of screening and in terms of prevention. Um, and also the um, long-term care system. It's also in tremendous flux, and we need to be thinking about elder abuse and what the impact is of not having a more a, a long-term care system of which people want to be consumers and what that means in terms of elder abuse because people stay at home in situations where they're abused, neglected, and exploited because they're so scared of long-term care. So we can do better than that there, too. Third, resources. And uh, this is one of the reasons that I left a job that I loved at the Department of Justice. And um, because I wanted to start being able to, uh, to talk about this issue more, and many others. Basically, if you work for government, you have to say, not only I don't speak for the government, but also you have to take a glass half full approach. Um, by their works and their budgets, we shall know them. Um, <laughs> um, these are not my numbers. These are the GAO numbers. And Kathy calls the GAO report on which these, this chart is based her calling card. Um, there are supposed to be tiny little slices, but they're as good as invisible. Um, you know, I have profound respect and affection for all of 
um, the folks in the federal government who are doing this work because they are doing, they are pedaling as fast as they can. But even Florence Nightingale on speed cannot take care of 40 ventilator patients and she can't, if she's an APS worker, take care of hundreds of cases without resources. And if she's Kathy Greenlee, she can't fund new programs without new funding. So at some point, we have to say the emperor has no clothes. We don't have the resources here. And if we compare it to other issues, then it's, you know, it's pretty bad. And if you look at private funding, it's even worse. Um, there's a reason that the knowledge pool is so shallow. The National Institute on Aging has a billion dollars a year. It gives away about one one thousandth of that money to elder abuse. The CDC, and I love Jeff Hall, but it's way worse. Fifty thousand dollars? That's nothing. Folks in the elder, uh, folks in the child abuse and domestic violence fields would not put up with that, and we shouldn't either. Um, we need a lot more Jeffs and Alex Crosbys and his um, and his colleagues working on these issues. Um, what is the message that we're sending? It isn't just for today, because as we're trying to appeal to new young researchers and social workers and physicians and nurses and attorneys, if we say we have a field where there's no money to do research or there are no progr programs to fund, how do we appeal to them? How do we get them to start wanting to come to this field? So the impact is not only today's, uh, on today, but also for the future. Um, if you fund them, they will come. If you don't, they will not. Oops. Um, we also need to recognize elder abuse as a public health issue. Um, in the United States, I can't think of another problem that affects as many people where less is being done. Um, we've recognized other forms of violence and maltreatment as being a public health issue. And I don't understand why we haven't made the leap here. Um, a colleague called me the other day from a family violence conference and said, you know, there are 1,500 people here and there are 15 people in my session. And all of us have had that experience. Bob Lancato and I were on a panel with Robert Butler, no less than Robert Butler, and there were 15 people. It was ASA, and we were in a small windowless room. And, you know, Something is not translating, and I think it goes also to the victims. These, the victims on whose behalf we're working are not victims who elicit the same kind of sympathy as other victims, and there are not many of these victims who can speak out on their own behalf, which is actually another reason that I left the Department of Justice so I could start writing about these victims' stories. Um, but I, I think that, you know, somehow we consider an older, demented person to be less human than other kinds of victims. So I think there's something going on there. Um, elder abuse and even long-term care were barely part of the long-term and uh, part of the health care reform discussion either. So we're having trouble getting traction everywhere. Um, We know how some of this public health stuff is done. I mean, you do, I don't. Um, and so we need surveillance, we need violence and injury prevention programs, and we need to think about this as a, as a public health um, problem in a broader way, too. The Institute of Medicine has had workshops on the workforce issues. You know, there's 75,000 pediatricians and fewer than 7,000 geriatricians. Um, and if you start to drill down to the academic pediatricians versus geriatricians, the numbers are even starker and the divide is even starker. There's something else, too. You know, we talked earlier about the reluctance of physicians to get involved in elder abuse cases. Um, in pediatrics, there's this interstitial layer of child abuse pediatricians or forensic pediatricians. They do that yucky work of dealing with child protective services and the courts and prosecutors and cops and all that. So that if you see a kid come into the emergency room or in your general practice, you can call that forensic pediatrician and say, I'd like to consult with you on that. We've got about three or four of them in elder abuse. And they are completely self-made. It's flying the plane while you're um, building it again and again and again. Um, so that's another area where I think we could have high yield um, for, uh, um, for modest investment. Okay, the Elder Justice Act. Bob talked about the Elder Justice Act. Let me just tell you, um, 
a little bit here. The Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act grew out of a movement. The Violence Against Women Act grew out of a movement. There was a lot of advocacy infrastructure. The Elder Justice Act really grew out of some conversations. I was at the Department of Justice. I was frustrated because there are offices that focused on violence against women. There are offices that focus on um, child abuse, but there was nothing. There was no infrastructure and barely any programs at DOJ. And I thought, oh, this is easy. Janet Reno thinks this is a great issue. And so I wrote up a little proposal and said, let's create some offices. And a lot of people in the hierarchy thought that was a great idea. And then, you know, I came smack into the wall of bureaucracy's reluctance to recreate themselves and create more work for themselves. So I thought, oh, great, we'll pass a law. You know, I was so ignorant. So I was working with my friend um, Lauren Fuller at the time, and I said, hey, what do you think? You know, this would be a really good issue. And she had just gone, well, she was actually still working for Senator Grassley at the time, and then she went to Senator Bro, and then she called me up one day and said, okay, game on. Um, Senator Bro is, um, is uh, interested. But the point is, that the law preceded the movement. We have Bob and the Elder Justice Coalition to thank for helping kind of back into movement, but we're not there yet. Um, we've started, and so, you know, that's, we don't have the social conversation, we don't have the cultural awareness. Um, you know, look at VAWA, well, yeah, look at the Violence Against Women Act. I mean, the advocates write that act, and they send it over to Congress. Um, let me go back. So this is, I'm moving on to the political constituency. What we lack in elder abuse that they have in the Violence Against Women Act and in the Alzheimer's realms is a political constituency. Um, the women's movement is tremendously organized. There are very powerful advocacy groups. They write the act. They have a very powerful champion in Vice President Biden way before he became Vice President. All of that matters. Look at, okay, and that's a violence prevention model. Let's take a look at a disease model. The National Alzheimer's Projects Act. That thing was passed after the Elder Justice Act, and that FACA, the Federal Advisory Committees Act, met way before the advisory board or the Elder Justice um, Coordinating Council, and who knows whether it's ever gonna happen. I mean, in terms of the Elder Justice Act, I am tremendously, I'm tremendously grateful that it was enacted. I'm tremendously grateful to have somebody like Kathy at AOA who cares about it. But aside from the Elder Justice Coordinating Council, it hasn't been funded or um, implemented. I mean, it's just sitting out there. And in my view, the most important role of that law to date has been as a coalescing force to create the beginnings of a movement. I think to call it a movement yet would be to overstate it. Um, We need to look at safe travels, Bob. <laughs> um, we need to have high level champions. We need to have policy infrastructure. We need to have advocacy infrastructure um, of the kinds of groups that we see in the child abuse, domestic violence, and Alzheimer's fields. Um, finally, innovation. You know, when I was working on the Elder Justice Act, and that was a pretty scary thing. We had about a month and a half to write, write it. But one of the people I called was Judy Salerno. Sid told me, I have a very smart, you know, deputy director, give her a call. And Judy told me, among other things, you know, look at the VA, but also innovation. Put an innovation fund in there. Because it's very hard to get um, a lot of these uh, project camels through the eye of these very narrow RFP um, P's and other solicitations at NIA, NIJ, or any place else. Um, and there's a lot, that is really what gives me the most hope. Um, um, Bob Wallace talked yesterday about telemedicine. I think that has tremendous potential in expanding the reach of healthcare provision. Um, my greatest hope is not for what's going on in Washington, but what's going on around the country. There are tremendous programs, there are tremendously dedicated people trying new things. We need to look at those laboratories of change um, in Houston and in Orange County and in New York City and in Michigan and in all over the place and figure out what works the best, how do we replicate it, um, and then how do we roll it out? Because 
Elder abuse is a preventable problem. I think that we need to go to the people with it, but we need to do it in a thoughtful way. Um, we've expended unimaginable intellectual capital um, and countless billions on lengthening life. The time has come for us to begin focusing more on improved well-being well in the years that we've gained. And in the great words of Tennyson, in one of my, fav my father's favorite poems, Ulysses, the last line is, and our charge, I think, is to strive, to seek, to find, but not to yield. Thank you.